Good morning. Welcome. We're glad to have you here with our, with, for our whole webinar today about olive oil. And we are excited to see that so many of you have joined us today to hear what we have to share with you. We hope that you will find this webinar extremely interesting and useful. My name is Tonia Dopwe. I am the founder and director of Guide My Growth, an online consultancy that works with companies in developing and emerging economies to help them increase their profitability so that they can raise funds for faster growth. Today, however, my role is to be your host and moderator and to guide you through this webinar to make sure that we answer as many questions as possible to make sure that we share the best possible information that we can with you and generally to help you on your way if you are not yet exporting olive oil to Europe, but if you are interested in doing so. Our session is jam-packed, so I am going to move forward very quickly to ensure that we don't lose any time. Um, before we get into the meat of today's webinar, there are a couple of things that I should tell you or share with you actually. It's very important for all of you to know that we cannot hear you and we cannot see you. So our only way of interacting with you is through the questions and answers tab. So please do feel free to share any questions that you have, whether technical questions or questions about the presentations that you're going to see today, feel free to share those questions in the questions tab. If you run into any problems, we have uh, had a couple of uh, technical audio issues at our end, at the back end, before we launch the webinar. So if the same applies to you and if you have any issues with audio or video, there are two things that you can do. One, the best thing and the fastest solution usually is just to log out of the webinar and use the link that you received in your email to log back in. Nine times out of ten, that solves the problem. However, if it doesn't and you keep having problems with the audio or video, you can also log into the webinar through your phone um, using the phone number that is available in your country. And for your information, it is a local phone number, which means that you will not be incurring international phone charges, local cost only. I've already said, if you have questions, please do feel free to, an to ask all and any questions via the questions tab. Our team at the back end will be answering questions during the webinar, but we also have two Q&A sessions, um, one right in the middle of the webinar and one at the end of the webinar, where we are going to tackle uh, the questions that you have asked. And when I say we, I am referring to our panelists who are with us today. And I see I still have an error on the slide to say that we have a few polls for you. We actually have only one poll for you today, which I'm going to launch in just a couple of seconds. Uh, because of the huge amount of information that we want to share with you, we decided to keep things limited to just one poll. Finally, for your information, today's session is being recorded. So if you do have technical issues, if you have to leave early, or if for whatever reason you cannot follow the entire webinar, don't worry. We're recording it, you are going to get the link, and you can review it at your leisure anytime you choose. But before I move on to introducing our panelists, I'm going to ask you to participate in this quick poll that I am now launching. We are very interested to hear where everyone is from today. Please enter your answers. Hello, Africa, Europe, Asia. A lot of people from Europe, a lot of people from Asia as well. Okay, and a smaller number of visitors today from Africa. I see that about two thirds of our audience has entered their answers. I'm going to wait just a few more seconds before closing the poll and sharing the results with you. Closing in three, two, one. Thank you for answering your answers. And this is what we see. So, and I have to actually enlarge my screen because I cannot see the results myself. But what I see here is that the majority of our attendees today are from Europe, closely followed by Asia, with a smaller representation from Africa. Welcome. We are very happy that you could join us.
and yes, I am back online. So I am going to introduce our panelists in just a couple of minutes. So before I do, I am going to call on the CBI to come online. But before I do that, I think in case you didn't know, today's webinar is focused 100% on olive oil and on exporting olive oil to uh, Europe, which means that we are going to be sharing information with you about the market in Europe. We're going to be telling you which countries are really the most interesting for you or hold the most potential if you are considering exporting olive oil to Europe. We're also going to be telling you about some of the trends that we see on the European market and trends that might give you a competitive edge in terms of uh, exporting your olive oil to Europe. We are also going to touch on market entry requirements, particularly food and safety, but also certification requirements, for example. What is expected from you if you do want to present your oil um, to buyers on the European market? And in addition to that, we have for you today uh, our we have our market researcher who is going to share that information about the market analysis and the market entry requirements with you. And in addition to that, we have three experts available today who are going to be sharing their vision on entering the European market, as well as how to convince buyers to buy your olive oil. And we are going to end the webinar with a I find very inspiring example of how a group of companies, and Renee from CBI is going to tell you a little more about that, uh, but how a group of companies from a particular country succeeded in working together and launching a new brand of olive oil, high-end olive oil, on the European market. So make sure that you stay to the end to actually get a good idea of how you might be able to use the information that we share with you to start exporting your olive oil to Europe. Renee, may I invite you to join us? Yes, thank there you. There you are, are. welcome. <laughs> and I don't actually remember, did I agree to share your slides or were, are you going to share your slides yourself? Um, you can share my slides if that's okay. Oh, okay, perfect. Then I'm going to move to the very first slide. It's all yours. Great, thank you, Tonya. Yeah, good morning, or maybe already uh, good afternoon, um, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, here today on this uh, on the CBR webinar. Uh, for the people who don't know me, my name is René van Woerden, and I'm working for CBI as a program manager. Uh, and I'm responsible for the implementation of uh, olive oil from Jordan. Um, uh, for listeners who are uh, actually new to CBI, let me just shortly introduce uh, who we are and what we do. So CBI is the center of uh, for the promotion of imports and uh, we are a Dutch government organization and we are funded by the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, it's our mission to connect small and medium-sized enterprises like maybe yourself uh, to the European market and to create sustainable and inclusive um, economic growth. Uh, and we do this uh, via strengthening uh, the sustainability of SMEs and encourage the exports of value-added products, for example, olive oil to Europe, but also to the regional market. And um, yeah, we, we help with finding practical solutions for bottlenecks and yeah, one of the bottlenecks can be, for example, uh, uh, good market information. Yeah, and that is the reason why we're obviously here. Um, we're working uh, with a lot of exports and we do a lot of research uh, on, the, on the relevant market information. Uh, and our experts are here also to share their tips and their practical solution and insights with you. Uh, and yeah, for this webinar, it's mainly focusing on um, the, uh, on olive oil. Um, so uh, the panelists who will be introduced to you uh, shortly. Uh, yeah, we're go really going to explore more about the potential of uh, yeah of exporting olive oil to Jordan sorry to europe <laughs> i'm already into the jordan you can actually go to the next slide uh, tonia because um this is um yeah actually a case study that we're going to discuss um today's webinar will be more on market potential on market trends uh, how to position your olive oil uh, but also how important storytelling is and uh, with this case study uh, Jordanian olive oil, 
uh, we would like to highlight a little bit more how important it is to, to yeah, tell the story and how to differentiate uh, your olive oil in, uh, in this competitive market. So in this uh, CBI project, uh, Jordanian Olive Oil, we're working actually with 12 companies uh, in a four-year uh, time. And we're working together with them on all the aspects what is actually necessary in exporting olive uh, oil to Europe. Uh, and there's also a great example how market information can really help to analyze the trends, the developments, uh, what is new, what are like uh, the gaps in the markets, and how you really can differentiate your products. Um, yeah, so we have our brand uh, experts here who has been working uh, hard on this um, yeah, new brand, the Jordanian Olive Oil. Um, so please stay tuned. Uh, that, guess, uh, that will come, uh, that follow a little bit later. Um, yeah, for now, uh, I really hope that today's uh, webinar will give you new ideas, inspiration, and uh, yeah, hopefully it will also uh, yeah, take you steps to improve your business in, uh, in preparing uh, in, into export to Europe. Thank you very much, and uh, back to you, Sonia. Thank you very much, Renee, and thank you for that introduction about CBI. And uh, before we move into the presentation by our market researcher, I realized that I forgot to tell you that we will, of course, also be sharing information with you about your main competitors. As in, not so much telling you about which com companies you're competing with right now, though you can find that information in the market study that we are also going to share with you at the end of this webinar. But we're mainly going to give you information about the main competing countries, their strengths, and hopefully some of their weaknesses as well, which is a very good segue to me introducing our panelists. And we don't have enough time today to actually ask them to introduce themselves. So as I call your name, uh, dear panelists and experts, I'm going to ask you to switch on your camera and maybe just say hi and I'll give you a quick introduction to our audience. And the first person I'd like to call up is Kasha. Kasha is our market researcher. Hi, Kasha. Hello. Kasha is the consulting director of the strategic analysis and advisory practices at Embrain. And Embrain is the company that carried out the market research about olive oil that we're going to be telling you about today. Kasha has a lot of experience, as you can see. Don't worry if you can't read the entire slide, you're getting the presentation. Um, but also worked for the World Bank and has worked in Africa and is today going to be telling us a lot about the olive oil market. Kasia, we look forward to your presentation. Me too. Ferry, may I invite you to join us? Sure. And Hi. There you are. Good Hello, morning. Ferry. Good afternoon. As, uh, we are going to hear Ferry's presentation in the second part of this webinar, but just for your information, Ferry is an expert in market access and sourcing, and he has worked with more than I can count companies to actually help them to export to Europe. And at the moment, I believe, Ferry, you are mainly working with the IPD and SIPO to promote market access for non-European olive oil producers. That's correct, right? Correct, Tonya. Perfect. Thank you for Thank being you. here today. Interesting. You have an interesting presentation. We look forward to that too. Me too. Francesca. See you later. Thank you. Francesca, may yes. I invite you to come online? Hi. Hello. And I'm very happy to Hi, see everybody. that your video has cleared up. We oh, had okay. some we had some video issues with Francesca earlier today, but it has cleared up. Francesca is Italian. She lives in the Netherlands and she is Francesca, you do just about everything. I mean, you're an olive oil grower, you're a consultant, you're an importer, you're an expert, you're a distributor of high-end uh, olive oil on the on the Dutch market. You are a, a judge, uh, you sit on the jury of uh, olive oil competitions, you train and educate professionals. A quick question, is there anything that you don't do? <laughs> They're all very interconnected to each other. And first of all, I am a technical expert of olive oil and uh, that's my background and uh, from there starts my passion and then my profession to import and distribute high-end olive oil in the Netherlands so they are really all interconnected and that other. interconnection thank you Francesca that interconnection is something that Francesca is going to be touching on in today's webinar as well because she's going to be sharing with us the importance of storytelling in convincing buyers to purchase a product from you, in this case, particularly olive oil. Francesca, I can't wait to hear your presentation. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. And finally, may I invite Job to turn on his screen? Hello, Job. 
Job is a sustainable entrepreneur and expert consultant at Behold in the Netherlands as well. And he has more than 20 years experience working in Europe, Africa and Latin America on uh, sustainable entrepreneurship. And Job, I, we're going to hear a little more about that, but mainly what later on in, during your presentation, but mainly what you're going to be sharing with us today is a recent project that you have worked on in Jordan. And Renee has said a little bit about it. I've said a little bit about it. You're going to be telling us and showing us a very inspirational example of how to enter the market. So we look forward to that. And particularly, I look forward to that as well. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the time has come for us to move into the market entry requirements, market analysis and the market entry requirements. And this is a presentation that is going to be provided and given to you today by Kasha. And Kasha, you should be able to launch the presentation right now. Okay, I've launched it. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So thank you, Tonya, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for attending this uh, webinar. Tonya already introduced me. Um, the one thing I'm just going to say uh, at the outset is that um, this is just a summary of the research we've conducted this year for CBI or an update of the olive oil research. Um, for the entire study, you can go to the CBI website, and I'm sure this presentation will also be made available to you um, after we're done. So um, this presentation today is uh, divided into three parts. The first part will be about the European market, what makes it interesting for you, and which specific markets um, or countries are most uh, have most opportunities. The second section will be on the competition in terms of products and other exporters. And the third section will be about trends, requirements, and some tips. So what makes European Union uh, uh, an attractive market in terms of the olive oil exports? Well, simply the fact that um, the European Union is one of the major um, olive oil, oil importers globally. Um, in 2021, it import, imported 86% of all, of, of all olive oil imports in the world. Um, on average, the imports have been growing on annually by 7% between 2016 and 2020. There was a slight decline in, uh, well, slight, a pretty big decline of 10% in 2021. This is mainly due to COVID, but we already will see a rebound in 2022. Um, five countries account for more than half of the imports. So these are Italy, Spain, France, Germany, and Poland. This is the top five importers in the region. Um, and Italy is by far the largest EU importer of extra, especially extra virgin olive oil, um, with 443,000 tons in 2021 alone. In terms of the consumption uh, characteristics of the European Union countries, we can see that Spain and Italy are the biggest uh, consumers of olive oil in Europe, followed by France, Greece, Germany, and Portugal. Overall, um, about 1.46 million tons of olive oil were consumed in Europe in 2021. This represents roughly half of the total global consumption. Uh, Spain and Italy, as already mentioned, are the biggest consumers. They uh, consume on average half a million tons uh, annually. Um, Greece, on the other hand, is one of the largest per capita consumers of olive oil. So this is 12 kilos per capita per year. It is expected that um, through 2025, there will be a, an annual rise in consumption in most of the countries, except for the biggest countries. So uh, on average, other countries in Europe will be growing uh, by 4%, but Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Greece, um, the markets where, which are already quite saturated and which already have pretty high consumption, um, are expected to decline slightly. Um, and finally, in 2022, we will see a 7%, there's a forecasted 7% increase in uh, olive oil consumption. This is due to a rebound from COVID, but also due to the war in Ukraine and uh, unavailability of sunflower oil. Um, to which olive oil became um, somewhat of a replacement. In terms of the import characteristics in the European Union, um, so 86%, more than 86% um, of EU olive oil import volume is from inside the EU, um, so essentially from the EU producing countries. And this is mainly from two countries, Spain and Italy, the biggest producers. 
a um, little over 13% of oil, all of oil imports um, volume is from developing countries and only 0.2% from the rest of the world. Um, what we see in terms of growth is that the developing country imports are growing at 12% per year between 2017 and 2021, um, while the intra-European or European um, imports are growing at 4.4%. Um, so this is a, a certain trend that shows that uh, the imports from developing countries are growing at a higher rate than the intra-European trade. Um, in particular, the extra virgin olive oil is gaining in importance and popularity in Europe. Currently, it um, comprises 58% um, of the imports into the European market. It is followed by Lampanta oil, 23%. Um, pomace oil is uh, constituting 15% and the remaining 4% are other oils. So it is expected that the consumption of the extra virgin olive oil will grow the most. Um, this is due to its positive image regarding health benefits um, and general quality of this type of oil. Um, but Francesca later on will tell you maybe even more about this. Um, so which markets specifically could be most important interesting for you as an exporter. Um, we think you should focus on the leading consumers, uh, but also non-producers at the same time. So on the left-hand side, um, you have a table of the uh, leading consuming markets which do not produce olive oil or do not produce it in large quantities. Um, and these are by order of importance, France, Germany, Belgium, Poland, the Netherlands and Sweden. Um, France, Belgium and Netherlands and the Netherlands actually produce some olive oil, but uh, they are net importers, so the amount that they produce is not enough to cover the domestic demand. Um, and specifically today we will talk about France, Germany and Netherlands as the most important or promising import markets. So France. France is the largest importer of olive oil in Europe among the non-producing countries. Um, in 2021, it imported 482 million worth of olive oil, um, and this translated into almost 139,000 tons of olive oil. Um, it mainly imports from Spain and Italy, so mainly from European producers, uh, but also from Tunisia, which is its largest um, developing country. Um, supplier and Morocco and other developing countries. France actually has a small local production, um, about 40, which accounts for about 44% of its consumption, but the remaining 96% of all of sales in Europe uh, in France are important. Um, Tunisia is by far the leading developing country importer to France. Um, it has a very strong organic offer and some emerging developing country importers include Morocco, Algeria, Turkey, Palestine, and Lebanon. In terms of the important market players, so in terms of the leading brands, uh, we have Puget, uh, Carapelli, Tramier, Monini, and the leading retailers with private labels in France would be Carrefour, Leclerc, and Auchan. The second most important market um, in terms of the non-producing countries is Germany. Um, Germany is a pretty important uh, importer. It has uh, growing olive oil imports and opportunities for organic suppliers in particular. Uh, its 2021 import value has been at uh, three, 345 uh, million and the import volume a little over 85,000 tons. Um, again, we see that the exporters to Germany are mostly European countries. So we have Italy and Spain, the two largest producers, but also Greece, which has been growing. And there is some growth or emergence of developing country suppliers. So in terms of the dynamics of its imports, um, we see that in Germany, the structure of the olive oil imports is changing. Uh, and particularly the share of the extra virgin olive oil has been increasing. It grew from 75% to 82% um, in the last four or five years. And the leading suppliers have been kind of shifting as well. So Greece, for example, in particular, has been growing the fastest. It almost doubled its exports since 2017. Um, developing countries account for only 1%. These include Turkey, Syria, and Palestine. Uh, in terms of the market players, so most are sold as private brands. They are listed here. Um, these are the private brands of the largest um, retail chains in Germany. So Lidl, Aldi, 
uh, Metro Cash and Carry. And in terms of the independent brands, the leading ones are Bertoli, Carapelli, Mazola, Minerva, Minos, Jordan, Ibarra, and La Española. The third market that we're going to discuss today is the Netherlands, which uh, is a traditionally uh, butter country. It consumes a lot of butter and sunflower oil, uh, but it also is observing a trend in the growth of olive oil. Um, and again, Francesca, who is based in the Netherlands, she can maybe tell you a little bit more about uh, the, the Dutch market. Um, in 2021, the import value um, of olive oil to Netherlands was at 100 million euros. The import volume was at 27,000 tons. Um, the share of exports of the top five exporters is pictured here. So Netherlands mainly um, imports from Spain, Italy, Belgium, Germany, Greece. Uh, but 4% of its imports is actually also from the developing countries. Um, Netherlands is a traditionally a re-exporting country, so uh, some share of, uh, of, if, of its olive oil imports are being re-exported to other countries. Um, in terms of the suppliers from the developing countries, its primary ones are Morocco, it's its leading supplier, followed by Palestine and Turkey. And uh, again, in the Netherlands, we see the consumption of olive oil growing. So what is your competition in the European market? Um, in terms of the countries that you are competing with, uh, as you might have already gathered from the presentation, um, the leading suppliers to, of olive oil to Europe are Spain, Greece, Italy, um, but also Tunisia, Portugal, and Morocco. So the main competitors come from the EU. Spain by itself accounts for more than 50% of all European olive oil imports. Tunisia and Morocco are the main non-EU suppliers. Um, Spain has a pretty large-scale production and a price-competitive assortment. In Italy and Greece, there are many small-scale producers who produce quite high-quality olive oil, um, and Tunisia in particular has a very strong organic product range. In terms of the products that you're competing with, these would be the rapeseed, sunflower, and soybean oils. So these are the oils that are most produced in Europe, and they're the main substitutes for olive oil. Um, sunflower oil is also the most imported type of vegetable oil in Europe. And of course, there's also butter, which is still very popular um, and is the most traded product of all fats in European countries. There are also other types of oils that are present in the European market. Um, some oils that are produced from nuts. Um, so, for example, hazelnut, walnut and almond. Uh, but also from seeds like pumpkin seed oil. And these oils would belong to the very high-end segment and would kind of, uh, you know, uh, ask for even more higher prices than olive oil. Um, but they're also used differently. They're not used as kind of ubiquitously as, uh, as uh, sunflower or, or olive oil. Other oils like argan, avocado, jojoba, and macadamia um, are also present in this market, but this is again a premium segment and it is used more uh, prevalently in cosmetics rather than um, in food. In terms of the competing countries, so Spain is the leading world supplier of olive oil. Its uh, 2021 export value, total export value was at 2 billion euros, um, and this translated into 718,000 tons. 58% um, of its exports go to Europe. Spain is mostly exporting extra virgin olive oil, but also some non-virgin, other virgin, virgin lampante and pomace oils. Um, its main destin export destinations are Italy, Portugal, and France. Um, so most of Spain's olive oil um, European exports, especially to Italy, are in bulk. Due to high prices, Spain is less competitive than olive oils from, for example, Italy, but also Tunisia, Morocco, or Turkey. Um, and Spain is really fully export-oriented um, because its production or domestic production, although it is growing, um, doesn't see a corresponding growth in consumption. So, so it's a pretty um, fulfilled market as it is. Um, you have a list here of the leading competitors, so who the main cooperatives are and largest bottling companies. I will not read them all, but this presentation will be accessible to you afterwards, so you can check them out. Italy is the second largest olive oil exporter in the world. Um, in 2021, it exported 627 million worth of uh, olive oil. This corresponded to 170,000 tons. 
um, its exports to Europe account for 40% of its total export value. In terms of the composition of the types of oils um, that are being exported from Italy, 63% is extra virgin olive oil and 37% are other oils. Its main export destinations include Germany, France, Spain, UK, Sweden and the Netherlands. Um, uh, in terms of the export dynamics and pricing, the prices of Italian olive oil are higher compared to other countries. Um, this is due to the large share of the extra virgin oils, uh, Italy's reputation as an oil producer and the famous retail brands, um, as well as the significant organic assortment that the country has. The destinations, export destinations that have been growing the fastest in the last five year period are France, the Netherlands, Poland uh, and Poland. Again, you have here the leading competitors in terms of, in terms of the main bulk players, as well as the bottling companies uh, with mills. Moving on to developing country suppliers. So Tunisia is the leading non-European producer of olive oil and exporter to Europe. Um, its uh, export volume in 2021 was at 145,000 tons. Uh, in terms of the composition, we see a very high uh, share of extra virgin, it's at 65%, followed by the virgin lampante, pomace, and other oils. In terms of the oil, uh, olive oil export destinations, we have predominantly Spain, but also Italy and France. Um, and the dynamics that are important to note are that the Tunisian olive oil exports to Europe fluctuate quite regularly. This is due to variable production um, and is also impacted to some extent by the tariff quota uh, imposed on Tunisia, which is 56.7 thousand tons. Um, most exports are in bulk, only 18% of exports are packaged. Um, and right now the Tunisian authorities or government are trying to extend the duty-free quota to at least 100,000 tons. Um, again, you have the Tunisian export companies listed here um, and more information about them. Morocco is the second uh, developing country competitor with an increasing European presence. Um, in 2021, it had an export value of almost 30 million euros to Europe. Um, this translated into 20.6 thousand tons. Uh, Morocco's uh, exports to Europe comprise 66% of its total exports. Um, in terms of the composition of its export, it's somewhat different from Tunisia. So uh, here we see that the leading um, olive oil product is the pomace oil, 76%, followed by virgin lampante, virgin, extra virgin, which is only 3%, and other types of oils. Uh, Morocco is mainly exporting to Spain, but also to some other European countries. Um, so France and Belgium are the European markets with most significant recent export growth, um, especially France with 54% uh, uh, growth yearly. So we see that uh, the, the imports from Morocco are really kind of growing in this country and Belgium the same with 33% per year. Um, again, you have a leading competitors here, which you can um, read about or check out later in this presentation or in the larger study. Kasha, okay, so may it, I, Kasha, yep. may I ask you to wrap it up in the next two to three minutes? Yep. Okay, so uh, the last section is the trends and requirements. So what is it that you have to watch out for while approaching this region? So um, in terms of trends, what we've seen, the key trends are that the healthier eating and popularity of Mediterranean food um, are impacting or boosting um, the sales of olive oil, especially the extra virgin. Uh, we also see new olive oil flavors, so um, the popularity of ol olive oils infused with aromatic ingredients such as chili and garlic, this is all on the rise. Um, there's an increased demand for organic uh, olive oil, um, and finally, the higher quality olive oil is becoming also more, more, more prominent and important in the market. In terms of the mandatory requirements for olive oil exporters to, to Europe, um, we can talk about the tariff barriers, uh, which um, are in place unless trade is covered under any free trade agreement or other special arrangement arrangements. Um, EU has also general rules on maximum residue levels, so contaminants uh, control in olive oil. 
Um, there's also uh, quite strict checks of the olive oil composition to make sure that the uh, category requirements are being met and there's no fraud. And finally, the quality requirements. So the chemical and sensory properties are checked thoroughly and there are also packaging and labeling requirements. Some additional requirements that you might uh, see in the market would be specific quality requirements. So some buyers might have special quality preferences. Um, there might be some food safety certifications required. So these are not legally necessary, but most importers will require you to provide some food safety certification and others. Um, there are also additional requirements on the corporate social responsibility. So companies and retailers will expect compliance with their code of conduct and other common standards. And finally, there might be some niche market requirements, um, some requests for, for example, organic sustainability and ethical certifications. In the last three pages, I discussed the different trends and requirements. On the right-hand side, you have some tips which correspond to those requirements, which you can also look at after this presentation. And finally, this is my last slide. These are some very general tips on increasing your chances of success in the European market. Um, as I said, these are pretty general. Uh, my colleagues, Francesca and Ferry, will give you something more detailed and something more practically oriented just in a moment. Um, but from a general perspective, uh, we think you should focus your efforts on the top six EU markets, especially on the markets which are the non-producing markets as presented in this presentation. Um, it is important for you to compare your offerings against those of established olive oil producers in the region, especially Spain, Greece, Italy, Tunisia and Portugal, um, and to be prepared to compete in a dynam dynamic region um, which uh, is the leading producer, consumer and exporter of olive oil. Um, it is very important for you to be up to date uh, with regards to the new requirements in the region, both the mandatory and voluntary ones to increase your chances of being selected. Um, and finally, you know, to be informed about the market itself. So uh, this is the purpose of this presentation and the study we've done. So please go ahead and visit the website of CBI to get information about the different topics um, that are useful to you as exporters um, and to other useful websites like the ones from the European Commission um, that will provide you with a pretty diverse range of data on the market. Thank you. I'm ready for questions, Tanya. Thank you very much for your presentation, Kasia. And we do have a couple of uh, questions coming in. So I am just going to put up the slide showing if this works well. Yes, showing our Q&A session. And Kasia, I'd like to, to kick off the Q&A session and invite our other three panelists to switch on their cameras as well. And Kasia, just kicking off with a question based on your presentation the impression that i'm getting is that since most of the olive oil that is supplied to the european union comes from european union countries and those countries have to adhere to very high standards and entry requirements what chance does any non-european supplier actually have to really compete with those other countries those other european countries well, it's hard to quantify, you know, what chance they have, but uh, but I think um, it's a pretty tough market. It's a it's a market that right now is quite dominated by European producers, European suppliers. But as we see from statistics, there is growth in imports from developing countries. So I think to some extent, it is also a, a market that could be open to novelty, the market that is open to quality. It is a market that is open to a, a good and compelling story. Um, origin story um, so you know I, I think the chances are there um, the good question would be you know how to how to increase those, ch those chances right and what kind of tips to follow in order to uh, to um, you know be more successful or have a have an entry point into this market okay uh, and I think that's something that Ferry and Francesca are going to be telling us more about in their presentations as well. And just to segue off the the what you said about the entry points into the market, which of the channels, and this is maybe a question for Jopo Ferry, I'm not quite sure, but please feel free to take it on whichever of you uh, feels the need. Which of the channels is the easiest to enter when it comes to the European market? Would that be retail, specialty, uh, food and beverage markets, hospitality? 
Jok? Yeah, um, that's of course a very good question and also a very difficult question to answer. Um, but I can only tell from perspective of like Jordan that we did like a, a kind of a research and, and we have limited volumes as well and we have higher quality. And then you see that retail at the moment is not an option. You know, if you are just getting started on the market, nobody knows you, you don't have the connections yet and you don't have the volumes then retail is certainly not like an, uh, a route for you to go. So we really like from Jordan perspective, we are focusing more on luxury. We are focusing more on Horeca, meaning that we really want to position as premium, also looking for luxury hotels, chef restaurants that are actually looking for something new, like a new taste, like to discover something new. So in that sense, with our um, with with our market research, we decided more to go into direct connections uh, with hotel and chefs and 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 maybe even a little bit of catering. But okay. And yeah, Ferry, I... sneak preview. Yeah, exactly. This is a little bit of of uh, our perspective as well of our experience that we gained. Um, the retail market, as Cassio already said, it's highly dominated by private labels as well and by those big brands that we see. So there is a lot of export or let's call it import happening to the European Union of olive oil from non-European countries. Much of it is happening in bulk, but when exporting in bulk, you're subject to quite some price pressure. So this is connected to the retail market. And of course, you will remain largely anonymous. Right, so it's uh, you will not be visible as a country. So all this thing that Cassia said that we will discuss later as well, this storytelling will not happen all too much in the retail market. There is a subsegment in the retail mar market which is focusing on high quality olive oils, uh, which is focusing on specialty oils, and this could be a way forward. There is even producers uh, or companies in countries such as Germany that have a diversified range uh, of origins in their in their olive oil. So they trade olive oils not only from designated areas in Spain or Italy or Greece, but then also sell Tunisian olive oil as Tunisian olive oil labeled on their bottles. So this okay. specialty segment can be something of an interest as well. But yeah, it's, it's hard to say which is the easiest because actually none of them are totally None of them easy. are actually easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ferry. And our first Q&A session is a short Q&A session, and we have a number of questions coming in on the questions tab. So if we don't get to your question right now, don't worry. We're going to pick it up in a second Q&A session. Um, this first Q&A session, before we move to Ferry's presentation, I would like to pose one question to Francesca, and the question is coming in from Ahmed. What are the most requested what is the most requested packing of oil in the EU? I think that would be packaging, probably. Packaging. Well, uh, some of that has been already touched uh, lightly by Ferry. It really varies by the channel where it gets distributed. So when we talk about retails, we are talking about oil coming in probably in bulk and then being packed in uh, bottles for the retail market. Uh, when we talk about specialty stores or if we talk about um, Horeca, uh, high-end luxury segment, what was mentioning Yop before, uh, we talk about bottling uh, and a format could be between 250 to 500 ml, uh, but also in the Horeca uh, is uh, important also to provide different entry level price for larger use, that could, could be, for example, in containers of five liters. Okay. So I would say that those three formats between the 250-500 ml for more uh, consumer use and also containers of five liters nowadays also available in a bagging box or tins, uh, those are quite popular as well. <clears throat> okay. And we have some very interesting questions coming in right now, but to make sure that we do stick to our time schedule a bit, I am going to put those, push those questions to the second Q&A session. Francesca, you're going to tell us more about packaging because I did see a slide in your presentation about uh, uh, the different types of bottling. Ferry, we are now going to move over to your presentation. 
and I am going to ask our panel to switch off, with the exception of Ferry, obviously, to switch off their cameras as we now move forward to a presentation from Ferry. And Ferry, I am transferring presenting rights to you. Thank you very much, Tonia. Thank you very much, everybody. It's a great pleasure being here with you. Thank you for attending this webinar. Um, as Tonia already introduced me, um, I'm working mainly for the um, German Import Promotion Desk. Do you all see my presentation now? Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. I was mainly working for the German Import Promotion Desk and the Swiss CIPO program, so sort of partner programs from the CBI program in the Netherlands. Um, so my perspective is pretty much the perspective from trade promotion, a little bit of a bird eye perspective. And I must mention that we've been mainly working with Tunisian olive oil producers as Tunisia is a designated partner country, both of the IPD program and the CIPO program. So what did we face when we started promoting Tunisian olive oil in the market? We faced some challenges at, as all exporters may face in the European market. The European market is not easy to enter, enter and the same goes true for the olive oil market. There's quite some challenges out there. And Cassia already has presented some of them. So we see a strong predominance of the local brands and the local producers just because there is so much of a production in the Southern European countries. Um, but also one thing which is very important for all you to know, and maybe you know, this European Union is a single union with free movement of goods. So it's pretty easy to move olive oil from Spain to Germany, whereas it is more complex and more complicated, for example, to import olive oils from abroad. So it's not only buying from neighboring countries, but from countries where documentation and customs is much easier. So we have a strong predominance by tradition of Italian, Spanish, Greek, Portuguese olive oil here in the markets. Um, we do have the retails that are setting up their own brands, their private labels that are pretty much dominating in the supermarkets, making it all the more difficult to enter with a private label, uh, with your own brand, for example, or as a new origin. Specific case for Tunisia also is the pretty tough EU tariff policy. Cassia has touched upon it. Basically, it means that every olive oil that is coming from Tunisia is subject to extra duty of one euro 25. And this makes olive oil coming from Tunisia much more expensive. There is a duty-free quota of 50, almost 57,000 tons where you can apply to, but this is dominated as well by larger importers. So smaller importers, medium-sized importers that want to kick off business with exporters and producers from Tunisia will face this hurdle of tariff policy, of not being able to apply for the quota, for the duty-free quota immediately, and of potentially paying extra customs on the product. So this was something that we faced that was uh, challenging. Uh, we managed to tackle it a little bit uh, with some of the companies where I can speak about a little bit later. Cassia already mentioned high legal and customer requirements as well. This goes true for all the foodstuff that we have in Europe. There is quite high standards that you must fulfill that are regulated on a legal basis. But customers here and consumers here in Europe more and more request additional standards and certifications. So organic is one thing. Uh, sustainability is one thing which is being more and more demanded. And of course, food safety standards on top. So a minimum basis of certifications is almost a must to enter the European market, making it a bit more pricey to tackle this market as well for all the exporters. What we've seen as well is distribution and logistics can be challenging, especially for the companies that try to bring their own product on the market, not selling in bulk, but selling bottled already as many Tunisians want to do. Um, bringing their bottles to the market would cater to the specialty segment, as I've mentioned before, but this is a segment which generally does not purchase full containers. They like to pay, uh, purchase pallet-wise, they like to purchase 
every other week, for example, making distribution on the ground a bit more challenging. And all this distribution and logistics to organize it from abroad can be difficult for you. So here, one of the solutions that one of the companies has taken was to establish a warehouse in Europe so take care of the imports first and then distribute on their own. Here you can look for adequate partners as well to work with together that can help you in the distribution and logistics on the European continent. Something that we've seen pretty lately is customer conservatism and this goes through extremely for the German market. The German market is a very price sensitive market, especially the retail market. We see a current market situation with huge inflation coming up um, unprecedented inflation for some of us uh, and this leads to growing financial concerns amongst the consumers so they turn every dime before they spend it and this is affecting especially premium segment of the olive oil so these challenges are out there um, it is important to know these challenges to elaborate tactics to overcome it you need to do your homework if you want to enter the European market. And for entering the European market then, my message is um, a strategic approach is a must. By this, you can increase your chances to succeed. And it's basically three things that you need to take into account. The first one is analyzing and understanding the needs and opportunities in the market to find door openers and to find your sweet spot, where can you go? And I'm happy to tell you, you're right in the middle with it. You're having this webinar, so you're getting the first information. You can go to the CBI report as well to get all the necessary information on the market, taking a look at requirements and trends. It is easier to sell something when you're meeting a trend, when you're corresponding to the requirements. Take a look at the market segmentation to find out which channel is the best one for you to sell to. As Cassia mentioned, taking a look at the competitor environment to be up to the challenge to see how they sell their product, what is it that they are selling and to differentiate yourself. And getting an idea about the price structure is also very much essential. No need for you to come to the European market if you cannot match with the European price ideas. If you can sell for better prices in your country of origin, for example, that maybe the European Union at this level is not the proper market until you may scale up and bring prices down, for example. So once you've gained that general understanding of the market, it is important to really target your appropriate customer group and the market segment you want to sell to. Once you've done that, you can come up with a solid value proposition with offering them some benefits and something that they need all together with a proper marketing strategy. And I will touch on point two and three just a little bit. So as producer and exporter, you want to bring your olive oil to the consumer to some extent. And this is something where we need to understand a little bit the, the channels of distribution. It starts off with the question who basically would be your consumer of the olive oil. We do have more than 450 million people in the European Union. So who will be it consuming your olive oil? Where are they located? Cassia was speaking about the different countries, about the different markets. So it's very important that you get an understanding of which market is the most promising for you. Is it Italy and Spain that are buying in bulk, for example? Or is it countries that would also purchase a little bit more in specialties, for example, Germany as a strong organic market. Very important question is as well, how do consumers consume the olive oil and how do they purchase it? And this leads us to the market segments that we find in the European market. Olive oil is mainly traded and brought to the consumers through retail, through Horeca or food service, through the food industry and through cosmetics. Now some producers, some exporters, they may have relations with representatives of those market segments directly. They may sell to the retail, to the food industry, to cosmetics directly, but this is just an exemption, just a few cases, because 
retail food industry cosmetics is not easy to serve, right? They are quite demanding when it comes to distribution, to volumes, um, to specifications. Some of them, they even do not import directly, but rather prefer going through middlemen. And these would be importers, for example, general importers, specialized importers for olive oil, but also wholesalers that may deliver to Horeca, that may deliver to the retail market segment. But we also see a lot of butlers and producers. Italy, for example, is purchasing large shares of uh, Tunisian exports and they bottle uh, blend it as well and then sell it as blended olive oils to the larger European market. So mainly those importers, wholesalers and bottlers producers will be the first point of contact for most of the exporters for you as a producer and exporter. Let's take a look again into the market segments and here we've already spoken about retail Horeca food industry cosmetics. Now let's take a look at the sub-segments in retail, which is basically dominating the distribution of olive oil, of extra virgin olive oil, most precisely in all European countries, we find those large outlets. The retail market is pretty much dominated by large retail chains, such as Carrefour or Chan in France. Uh, we find Albert Hein in, in Netherlands. We find Lidl in Germany, Rewe, Edekar. They are dominating large parts of the market but we also find those specialty stores that can be very interesting. So specialty stores for the fine foods, um, specialty stores for olive oils that trade different varieties of olive oils, but we also find ethnic markets. Um, for example, in Germany, there is a lot of Turkish supermarkets that deliver a lot of Turkish uh, olive oil as well to Turkish speaking community, but also to the rest of the consumer group. Horeca, this is an abbreviation for hotels, restaurants, and caterings, uh, but we also find bars and canteens uh, that use olive oil in their food preparation. So does the food industry. Here it is interesting to get an understanding of the application, uh, which will help you to sell and position your product then later on. So is it ready meals that is using olive oils? Is it canned fish? Canned fish is more and more um, substituting sunflower oil as well to olive oil to add some value to it. Production of jars and spreads is using olive oils and then others as well. In cosmetics, we see that olive oil is pretty much uh, popular in shampoos, soaps and others. So get this understanding to find out your position in the market and how to sell your product along to those people. Now you've done a first research on the market, you've analyzed it, the distribution channels, trends, requirements, etc. Now it's time to approach the buyers. And here, the first step is really to gain the visibility because not all of the consumers, not all of the buyers are aware of that there is producers outside of the European Union, others than maybe Tunisia and Morocco even. So you need to gain visibility and then light their fire. You will have to invest in your marketing if you want to market your product properly. For this, we found out that for most buyers, a company website is almost a must. Once they see your company name on a business card, they will check out if you have a company website to get some more information about you, but then also to check if you're a professional company, if you're trustworthy. So company website has become sort of a must for the marketing. Social media, depending on the consumer group that you target, is becoming more and more important as well, gaining momentum also for the buyers and for the decision-making process for presenting your products um, than directly to the buyers. Marketing material is essential. So high quality brochures and catalogs to show your product, um, company presentations as well is very much important. And so are technical data sheets, which comprise all the technical aspects of your olive oil, acidity, et cetera, et cetera. Media publication is a good way to gain visibility as well. So are events. Europe is great for trade events. We do have some leading trade fairs here on the European continent. Here is some events and conventions, which is not at all comprehensive. Um, given respect to the time, I will not go into detail here, but you find events that are for food in general, 
you find events that are catering to the food service or to the Heraklid channel, you find events for the cosmetics industry, you find events that are pretty specific for the olive oil sector, like the word olive oil exhibition or the uh, Amsterdam International Olive Oil Competition. So taking part in these competitions can be also very useful for you to gain momentum here on the ground. Ferry, could I ask yes, you please. to round it up in the next one to two minutes, please? I will so. Sure, thank, thank you, you, Tonya. So recommendations for your marketing, be clear about your benefits. Once you have identified your consumer, it is important to present them something that they can make use of, a real value. So provide real be benefits, build your value proposition, make it easy to understand, keep it short and simple, use clear messages and use pictures that can create emotions. We've seen great impacts of wonderful pictures that people show that help a bit in the storytelling. And this is what it's basically about. We've highlighted it more. Uh, in the beginning, and Francesca will speak more about it. Storytelling is all about selling a bit more than just the product, okay? Your value proposition is more than just an oil. Just because customers, they want to get the full picture regarding your company's history and tradition, your technical expertise and know-how, the way you treat customers, your people, and the environment, all of this can present a value added to the customer and can be the decision-making criteria in the end, which can be beneficial for you. Important as well, your USP, what differentiates you from the competitors, from the European competitors, but also from non-European competitors. Why should they purchase from you? Very important to keep these questions in mind when you present your offer, when you prepare your offer to the European market. And with that, I say thank you very much for your attention and I wish you Loads of success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Ferry. And uh, without further ado, I would like to ask Francesca to join us as she will be taking us through her presentation. And here I am. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ferry and Kasha. I will cross-reference to some of your information and I'm happy to be here with you. Hope to give you some valuable information to proceed with your work further. So my point of view is the one of uh, somebody very passionate, first of all, about extra virgin olive oil and uh, bringing it uh, in a country where the main uh, consumption is not extra virgin olive oil, what we could call as a butter country. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, briefly my story, that's exactly where I come from. Uh, so I am an olive grower. Uh, I grew up uh, with olives and I grew up with olive oil from birth. And uh, we did everything with olive oil from breakfast to the evening meal. Um, next slide, please. And I am in this wonderful country, Netherlands, since more than 20 years. And uh, of course, the main uh, product from the countryside is certainly not coming from olives, but comes from milk and it's butter. Next. Uh, you already know a little bit my history. Uh, so uh, what I would like to emphasize is really like I'm coming from production of olive oil. I still have my own brand that I bring it in the Netherlands and I place it in retail market. And um, I am uh, an importer of uh, premium extra virgin olive oil from uh, mainly from all over Italy. Uh, besides that, I have a technical background. So uh, I am a professional taster um, from uh, international uh, national organization of olive oil tasting in Italy, and I take care of uh, assessment of uh, uh, oops, some flipping uh, organoleptic assessment of virgin olive oils. Uh, I'm jury member, and I train. We can go further next. But why I would like to speak to you, uh, we heard the statistics and the potentials of the market. I would like to talk to you more about the emotional factors, why uh, there is so much interest uh, in olive oil and consumption of olive oil. 
Of course, uh, we have seen that escalating madly with the pandemic, but it was already a trend and continues the trend. There is definitely much more pleasure and interest in home cooking with good ingredients and good food. Uh, and central for that is certainly the Mediterranean diet. Uh, we all know about the Mediterranean diet because we all travel more from North countries to Mediterranean, Italy, Greece, Spain. Uh, and also central because of the well-known uh, nutritional benefits, uh, so attention on healthy lifestyle and food quality is very important in the consumption model nowadays, and it's actually an interest in increasing trend. Next, please. However, although extra virgin olive oil is a beautiful product, uh, it presents a lot of challenge. My path every day is not free of challenges. Mainly, um, every day I'm faced with uh, the lack of knowledge out there uh, in the consumer about uh, extra virgin olive oil. And I'm sure that in the public today, uh, although there are many experts, uh, technical importers, producers from Jordania or maybe other countries, I'm sure that there are a lot of people that don't exactly know what extra virgin olive oil is. There is also a very big confusion about fats in general. Uh, healthy fats, unhealthy fats, cholesterol, uh, overheating, cooking with olive oil, baking oil. So uh, again, people don't know. Um, Obviously, cultural differences, you have seen me, and I told you, my grandmom used to do French fries with extra virgin olive oils. Uh, cultural differences, this is something that uh, we don't do here in the north of Europe. And uh, so there are large uh, differences between north and south. Um, and of course, there are distribution channels that are already established with brands, uh, and there are price challenges. Next, please. So the poor consumer, when he's sitting in front of a shelf, uh, whether it is a supermarket shelf, but also in a smaller shop, uh, he's confused. Uh, labels are reporting a lot of words. They're really, truly words, and they don't mean much to the consumer. Robust, unfiltered, uh, family reserve, cold pressed, DOP, baking oil, uh, really mostly the consumer don't know how to find orientation, why uh, and what to buy. <clears throat> Next, please. On top of that, of course, we have the supermarket price range, uh, which is approximately below the three euros and from below three euros to below 10 euros for a bottle of 500 ml. And, um, and those are uh, brands established for a long time. Next. So now I would like to uh, go one moment backwards and quickly say what is exactly extra virgin olive oil. I like that everyone thinks when we talk about a quality product in the case of extra virgin olive oil, uh, it's not just a fat, it's just not to moisturize salad, it's a very precious ingredient in our kitchen, at our table. This is how I like to think, this is my perspective, and this is how I present it to my clients or to people who want to know more about it. And um, so we can go further. Why is that a very precious ingredient? Actually, extra virgin olive oil is extracted directly from the fruit, meaning to say from the olive. And uh, because of that, uh, well, uh, besides it needs to pass all the physical and chemical uh, laboratory tests, very importantly, extra virgin olive oil to be classified as such, which is the first and highest product category, uh, needs to have a fruitiness uh, in an imaginary scale from zero to 10 above zero. In fact, it comes from the fruit, it has to be fruity. 
and uh, most importantly it has to have zero defect this at the organoleptic test so tasting olive oil is so important to classify it as uh, extra virgin or eventually of a lower category but we focus now on extra virgin olive oil which is my market uh, we can go further next slide and Francesca, may I ask you to wrap it up in two minutes, please? Sure, getting there. So extra virgin olive oil of high quality is so precious because it has smells and taste from the nature, something that is present in our daily life, artichoke grass, tomato, bananas, almonds. You can go further next. So. At this point, I would like to give that message to who is producing olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, that uh, yes, we put down our marketing history, but we really have to keep focus to the product and to the importance of what is inside the bottle. And so this happens by, with the cultivar, the territory, the typicality, and especially by putting uh, in the market an extraordinary taste that is enriching our table, enriching our food, combining with our food. And so extra virgin olive oil as a precious ingredient, part of the kitchen and food pairing is a very important aspect of the product to sit next to all the marketing tools that we have explored so far. So we want to create emotions, emotions at the table with a nice smell, a nice flavor. When I heat a little bit of olive oil in my kitchen, the old kitchen smells nice and all the family is really happy to be invited at the table. This is part of the emotions that the product really will transmit. Next, please. To do this, you also need people that are competent, uh, uh, that create the marketplace, that educate your partners uh, that are going to talk and to speak about the properties of extra virgin olive oil with retailers, with consumers, which bring the word forward. Next, please. So to say that uh, the product, in my opinion, has to have, first of all, no compromise on the quality to transmit all those very important aspects, which are really the features of the extra virgin olive oil itself. So investment in quality. Next, please. There is nowadays a trend to premiumization of the market. Maybe you can choose one of the competition. I'm not suggesting any of this, but just choose one of those that you think relevant to your market and stick to that and build up a path and an history challenging yourself, improving and also communicating the features through the competition. And finally, next slide to wrap up. However, today we said a lot of things and um, I'm sure that this can be also quite overwhelming for the producers themselves. Uh, nowadays, actually producing high quality extra virgin olive oil presents a lot of challenges, challenges of any kind, like including climate changes, which are really important and they force to a lot of technology and investment. So I'm quite sure that the producers themselves first of all, to create products that stimulate and bring emotions at the table, have a lot of challenges. For example, the need of technology, need of a lot of investments in the milling process and in the farming process. A lot of research, probably panel taste locally to learn and to implement product with the standards of the European market. So knowledge to be developed and also a lot of cultural changes, probably for the farmers themselves to act and to do differently and uh, to stay in the European standards. And I'm sure you probably have, if you have questions later, maybe there are more challenges you want to talk about and uh, we are here to help you. Thank you. And we have a lot of questions coming in in the, in, in the questions tab. Thank you so much for that interesting presentation, uh, Francesca. Yeah. Uh, we will see you again in a couple of minutes after Job's presentation. I'm going to ask Job to come online, switch on his camera, and uh, Francesca will be back with Ferry in just a couple of minutes. And um, Job, yes, uh, I will be moving your slides along, so let's get started. Yeah, and I know we are a bit like squeezed with time, so let, let us go uh, quickly. 
Um, purpose of this presentation is to give a bit of a background how in the CBI project we have been working to develop a sector brand for Jordanian olive oil, starting really from scratch. So there was nothing. So we had a great opportunity to unite with the sector and to develop this brand. And it gives a bit of tips and tricks and a bit of like insights how we did it. Next slide. So this was the objective, like how to position Jordan's olive oil sector for the European market in a way that differentiates itself from already existing olive oil brands and prepare for commercial growth. Uh, so that was the challenge that we went into. And as you already noticed, on a very competitive market, not only with all kinds of different kind of countries, other countries, other producers, other brands, other uh traders so very difficult and really see what is the sweet spot for jordanian olive oil next slide so some key elements uh, how to create a sectorial brand identity some success factors i think the good part of this was um uh, this project was that it was part of a larger export promotion program but also quality improvement program and export readiness of the companies like we can develop a brand but if the exporting companies do not have like high quality olive oil the brand is without use because the brand is immediately affected when your quality is not right so the good point about this project that we were part of a bigger team to pro uh, to promote the entire sector for sustainable development and progress another aspect is that you really do it together with and for the sector so really unite private sector with public uh, authorities with all the stakeholders in the sector and i think that is actually also one of the biggest wins it's not only the brand that we develop but it's also through our participatory workshops we really united everyone everyone uh, together defined their vision their mission their strategy their dream for the sector and really had to work as one team so there was a really like a uh, good outcome of this uh, exercise as well uh, as the um, uh, previous uh, speakers already mentioned you really have to look like okay what really makes you unique what is your brand dna and what is your positioning what makes jordan different than lebanon than morocco than tunisia and other countries. So really deep dive into the DNA and going through the history and the tradition and all the aspects of Jordania. And then of course mix, mix, mix it or match it with the right demand. And because you can have a beautiful product, but if there's no demand for the product, there's no use to start promoting that. So you really have to look at the product market combination as also already explained by previous uh, speakers, like which countries are you going to focus on? Which sectors are you going to focus on? What market channels are you going to channels are you going to focus on? And then based on that, you have to define your sweet spot, your uniqueness for this niche market. And as I already said, we will focus on single origin, single estate, maybe even single variety and bring it directly to the end consumer which can be in specialty shops or which can be in more premium uh, gourmet um, kind of restaurants, hotels and catering. Then if you know everything, you develop your vision and your brand DNA, you have to of course translate that into very simple and all com echo encompassing visuals. Now, what's your name, what's your logo, what's your slogan, this one liner that differentiates you from the rest. And in that aspect, it's actually interesting to tell that first we had the name of Jordan Olive Oil. But of course, Jordan is already a very big brand and established brand on the market. So only that we already had to change in Jordanian olive oil to give a simple example, but a very specific example. Then uh, based on that, you're going to develop your narrative. So like what's your uh, value proposition to the consumers, to the business to business, like your one page strategy that, that sets you apart. And if you have that with the storytelling that you can, of course, then also translate to the materials. 
Then the most important thing is to get approval and legal ownership because you have to register um, uh, your brand name and your IP. So we had to do that uh, through the Ministry of Agriculture, for example, in Jordan. And then secure consistency. So make a brand manual, brand governance, brand management to make sure that everybody speaks the same language if they talk about your brand. So you give them full script of your communication, how you want to communicate, how you want to set, get your message abroad. Translate that into marketing collateral, banners, websites, video, uh, flyers, everything. And then last but not least, you have to start creating awareness. As, as uh, the previous speaker already said, you have to gain visibility. So we did like a brand launch nationally and also internationally. And we were lucky enough to get like massive um, social media attention, both in um, uh, Jordan as well as on the international market. And to see if we've done a good job, I will now show the video because that actually explains it all. And to our audience, we had a couple of technical issues, so please bear with us as we now try to launch the video and hopefully sh share the sound and video with you. Yeah, so what you see hopefully in the video is that we did the storytelling actually in line with also the previous presenters. You know, we really looked like, okay, what's our history? What's our heritage? What's our culture? What are our symbols? What are our USPs? You can click um, Tony on. And, and really like to, to, to combine all these elements, also these logos, these symbols, this what makes uh, actually and Jordanian olive oil unique. We try to blend that actually into one flavor. We put it all together and we put it in like this brand that we have, like with, with this original taste, with the Levant cuisine, with the Holy Land, with the cradle of olives, focusing on super premium, focusing on craftsmanship, on tradition, on single origin, estate of variety, and really bring it all together 
in the logo that we just also presented and which we can see on the next slide. And also then you do a lot of iterations, you know, you create all these kind of logos that actually relate to this history. But as we have like 200 listeners in this webinar, we will also have 200 opinions. So it's very difficult to select the right ones. And the way we did it, it's also important to know that the brand doesn't belong to you. It be belongs to the buyers. So we selected the top five with our inner group and with our stakeholders and then actually presented to the buyers in Europe. And they made like a selection of the final two. And then together with our stakeholders and with the decision makers and with also the support up until the level of the Minister of Agriculture, we decided to select for this brand. And of course, it helped very much that the minister liked the brand a lot. So here also in this brand, you see it all coming together. The, seven star which is unique for the jordanian flag and only australia has another like the seven star in this symbol you immediately see the olive oil you see the color of gold which resonates of course with the bit of the color of the olive oil but also of our luxury and premium positioning that we want to do we use arabic text to make it exotic to make it new to make it a bit like appealing you know something something new and of course the green, the colors of the olive. And, and the tagline really was like, okay, discover. So it's something new for the buyers. They, everyone is looking for something new. So that is actually our, actually our sweet spot. The original taste, it has a, a unique flavor, actually, the Jordanian olive oil. And then from the heart of the Levant cuisine. So what we believe, Messe is a bit like the new tapas. You know, you have all this hummus, all this beautiful food, all these Lebanese restaurants popping up in Europe. So it's very popular. So we want to tap into that new cuisine and that hype and also that hype that consists of olive oil in the core of the product. Next slide. And I think it we did a good job in really setting us apart from, from all the other olive oil sector brands as you can see here i think we are quite differentiating uh, and a unique positioning that's what we try to do and ho hopefully we did a good job next slide and we launched it on cial uh, so we did a big launch in um, in uh, amman for the national market also amman invited the international olive council to Amman for a big gathering, so we already had the opportunity to position in the hearts and minds of the core olive oil industry and all the actors in all the other countries. Then we did it again also at CL with lots of publicity, also support, important support also from the Minister of Tourism, because that can actually be the angle for Jordanian olive oil. As 5 million tourists fly into Jordan, if everyone would buy one bottle of olive oil, we will already reach our targets. Thank you so much, uh, Tony. Thank you, Job. And I believe that your last slide here is the key message to, I think, every one of us in this webinar today. We have been sharing a lot of information, but now the actual, the real work starts. And while I invite our other panelists to turn back their, to switch back on their cameras, we are moving into our second Q&A session. And I am going to start with a general quick question, I think. And for our audience, we are officially at the end of the, uh, the, the time that was allotted for the webinar. Obviously, it is now 11.30 in Europe, but we are going to extend it to be able to answer a number of your questions. We have a lot of questions coming in. If you cannot stay, we absolutely understand. And again, we are recording the webinar, so you can review the Q&A session at your leisure, as well as the final information that we share. If you can stay, we're happy to have you, and we're going to try and answer your questions as quickly as possible. Um, one of the questions that came in is, what is the opportunity for South Africa to export oil to Europe? And for our panel, given the time constraints that we are, I'm going to ask you to answer quick and to give a quick answer and a short answer. Uh, opportunities for olive oil that is produced in South Africa. Anyone familiar with it? Ferry? 
I haven't touched on this one, but I think it goes pretty much into the direction that Yop has presented. Everybody is looking for something exotic, something new, and maybe it's just because of being something totally new, something totally unknown, uh, that this could be a story to t to sell. Then, um, and, and here I would say this definitely goes into the specialty uh, uh, channel, distribution channel, where origin matters, where origin is part of the storytelling and can be sold along. Okay, thank yeah, you, Gary. Maybe if uh, I can add to that is also pairing of uh, products like, um, for example, it goes very good with wine and actually olive oil follows a bit like the rhythm of wine 20 years ago. Nobody knew about the Merlot or a specific variety of fruits that will also come to the olive oil industry. So actually also if you get a recommendation with your food in a restaurant, they say, okay, this is the recommendation for the wine. In a few years' time, you will also have a recommendation of olive oil to use with a special recipe that's on your plate. So, especially if you focus on South Africa, I would immediately make the connection with wine, also wine exporters, wine distributors, do pairing of the wine together with the olive oil that is a bit in the same uh, chapter. And of course, with tourism, eh? just like Jordan, uh, tourism in South Africa is or used to be very popular. So also that's a big market, of course, because then you all have South African lovers who went there on a holiday, then they see the South African olive oil or the South African wine, and that's actually your biggest ambassador on the market. So that would also be my uh, recommendation. Advice. Thank you, Job. And Marie-Giselle, Marie I think that should be able to help you on your way. Kasia, a question for you. Um, the Netherlands, are the, are the Dutch olive oil producers? I we saw that question. Questions. Yeah, I saw that question. I think it's a mistake in the presentation. I, I don't think Netherlands um, Netherlands grows olives. Um, so we have to check back on that. Uh, maybe it was in the capacity of just re-exporting, somehow enhancing the imported oils, okay. something like that. But, we, but no, yeah. I, I don't think we're trying to promote the message that uh, that Netherlands the will become the next producer of olives <laughs> in for Europe. For our audience, we will check that in the presentation and make any corrections yep. as necessary before sending it to you. Francesca. Yeah, we have some uh, brands, as Francesca knows, some Dutch brands. So maybe that can be the confusion, you know, like some brands that actually imported yeah. it and do, did and it. And we exported brand, it. Like uh, oil and vinegar, for example. Ah, yes, okay. Uh, Francesca, a question for you about the import of Lampante. Um, the import of Lampante is, is fairly high, and what are we doing with that? Like, you can't actually find it on the market in the Netherlands. Um, is it refined in the Netherlands and then sold? What can you tell us about that? And Francesca is muted, I think. Yes, here I am. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, importing of Lampante in the Netherlands, uh, to be honest, I would not know whether it's imported in the Netherlands. As far as I know, Lampante is uh, reworked as a refined oil and in other countries, mainly Spain, for example, is a large refiner industry, but also other producing countries. Uh, and uh, what happens with Lampante goes then uh, blended with uh, extra virgin or virgin olive oil, so oils uh, from other categories in order to bring it back into the market into other product, which is what we call baking oil, for example, uh, uh, which is refined oil for 95% uh, and 5% uh, extra virgin or virgin olive oil. So the market of Lampante exists, but not itself, because Lampante itself is not for human consumption. It needs to be refined and it needs to be reblended with other oils. So as far as I know, this industry doesn't exist in Holland. Okay, thank you very much, Francesca. You're welcome. And moving on with a question directed at Ferry, I think, from Caroline. What strategy do you recommend for Tunisian suppliers who have to deal with the contingency challenge? And this, Ferry, I think, touches on what you said, what it was you or your by sorry, no, you said it, I believe. The challenges in the German market that uh, the, the, the buyer is very, very 
conscientious when it comes to making a decision about how to spend their money. Following up with the question, if the fact is that a lot of Tunisian producers seek help entering the German market, but importers are very ca cautious due to the red tape. Is the Tunisian olive oil trade ruled by a Spanish, Italian and French olive oil mafia? Yeah, very interesting question. Uh, it feels like a little bit uh, that it's ruled by a mafia. It's for the for the buyers here in in Europe that would like to start with Tunisian olive oil. This contingency, this quota is definitely challenging, right? In the end, it all comes down to price. So if you have to pay one euro twenty five per per kg or per liter extra on your olive oil, this is making it more expensive. Um, so why not simply buying it from larger importers that are based in Spain, in Italy, and in France, that dominate sort of the imports from Tunisia, and that can negotiate prices that still make it sort of competitive. Okay, so this this hurdle is quite high for somebody who wants to start importing from Tunisia, because the first two years anyway, you have to pay the quota because you need to prove that you have done imports on a regular basis. So at least two years, you must have imports under this one euro 25 extra uh, on every day that, that, that you import. Only then can you apply for the quota. But this quota is limited, as Cassia already pointed it out, it's just 56,700 tons. Which, which may seem much for a producer, but it's not much for the market itself. So it's really limited. And people that apply for the quota need to bank uh, uh, sort of uh, um, yeah, certain money beforehand before they can get the quota. You do not get the 100% that you apply for. Sometimes it's just 5 to 10%. So you bank a lot of money. Later on, you just get a little bit of the quota, making it really a lottery and really difficult. And, and many people are hesitant to this. So this explaining the content. Now I'll come to the solution a little bit. In the end, it's a matter of price negotiation. So an opportunity could be that you agree with an importer that is really interesting in starting something with you on a certain price. Let's say, okay, I might reduce my price a little bit if you can do so. I might reduce my price as an exporter and producer for the first two years. And then for the third year, we come to an agreement. The most uh, promising case that we've seen was a company that has set up a sister company in Europe that is handling the imports on their own. So they took off the burden on their shoulders. They did the imports on their own for two years until they could apply for the quota. And now they can trade their olive oil that they produce in Tunisia, can trade it from market. Europe already, let's say, uh, uh, introduced to the European market with all the customs paid, et cetera, et cetera. So this was one of the very smart solutions that they had. Um, but yeah, in the end, it's a matter of, neg of negotiation, negotiation yes. and you need to be price aware in this regard. Okay, thank you so much, Ferry. And looking at the time, I'd like to, to answer two more questions right now and ask our panel to give uh, quick answers, two or three questions. Uh, we have a question here about the opportunities for Latin American products. And I believe that what Job said just uh, earlier about South African products, the same applies to the Latin American market. Uh, specialty, pairing it with other products. Job, would you like to give a very quick response to that? Yeah, difficult, difficult to say so, but I think you already gave the answer. And it's also very specific, so I don't know the unique quality and the unique characteristics actually of uh, Latin American um, Okay, project. there are two examples being mentioned here and our uh, Jean-Pierre uh, is saying that uh, Chile and Argentina have good olive oil that it might be interesting to evaluate as options so that is maybe something that could be followed up with CBI after this webinar and Francesca yeah, a question maybe, Sorry, maybe a quick answer could also be focus on regional markets huh? especially what you see in Latin America, that it's always like a con continent on its own, you know? So if you are from Argentina, it could also be very favorable to look at Brazil or to look at Colombia or to look at your regional market force. And that is also a bit part of the strategy now also within CBI, and eh? not only to focus on Europe, yeah. but to focus well, so on to look at the regional market, market which yeah, makes definitely. more sense, you know, to go all the way over the ocean, you know, really like, 
focus on uh, basically Chile and Argentina, focus on the regional market first, and then as step two or three, yeah. maybe look at the European market. I think that's in short what Rob is saying. And Rabeb Sassi has a question for Francesca here, I believe it will be. Francesca, very short answer, please. Refined olive oil dominates the shelves of uh, the UK supermarkets. What can we do to improve the education of uh, consumers regarding quality? Invest in education, find the right partner that can uh, speak about you, get yourself competent, study about uh, olive oil tasting. So create a network around education for this pre precious but very difficult product to be understood. Thank you. And to be on. Thank you. You're welcome. Invest in education. Kasia, very shortly, final question for you. Uh, exports from outside the EU are rising faster than import within the outside EU imports are rising faster than import within the EU. Is there a specific reason for that? You are okay. muted, I believe. I'm yeah. unmuted now, yeah. Uh, I don't think there's one reason for that, but um, I think, you know, it could have to do with the price competitiveness of the developing country suppliers. It could have to do with the fact that some of the largest developing country su suppliers, so Tunisia and Morocco, have been investing in their production, so modernizing it. They've received some EU funds also to uh, modernize and, and kind of, you know, uh, be able to export to the EU um it can go back to the answers that we've already given about uh you know there there being a demand for niche or exotic or um also high quality organic oils um so mm -hmm. it's probably a mix of that uh also combined with probably growing interest among the developing country suppliers in exporting to europe and kind of growing efforts to do so Okay, so not one specific reason, but do your market research if you are interested in, yeah, uh, in looking also, at that. Also, as we've shown, you know, consumption is growing. This is a, mm -hmm. a given, you know, the, the production, the European production is quite large, um, but those countries are also exporting elsewhere. So, um, so, you know, there is, you know, a big likelihood that there is space for this. There's demand for, for products. It's just a matter of finding your right way to market. Okay. And write support in that, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry to cut you off. We still have a couple of questions that we cannot really address now, but I hope we're going to address after the webinar. We are running late, so I am going to say a quick thank you to our panel and thank you, uh, as in saying goodbye to you right now. Thank you so much for being a part of our panel today and thank you for your very interesting presentations and for being a part of our Q&A sessions. We loved having you and we hope to see you at another webinar. Thank you very much. And right now, I would like to invite Renee to join us again. And Renee, I am trying to switch presentation rights to you, but for some reason, I can't see it right now. So maybe if you would be so kind as to start with your initial slide. Yes, thank you very much, um, Tonya. I just have a... Uh, um, very uh, short time necessary. I only want to uh, show you the website of CBI where you can get more information uh, about market trends, developments, etc. Uh, but Tony, if you can give me some rights to show, then I'm going directly to the CBI website and show, um, yeah, what we can I see. Am Doing my best, uh, but <laughs> for some reason I cannot transfer it to you. You're it, back end at CBI. Would you have the opportunity to transfer presentation rights to Renee, please? I think it is working. I think you can see my screen now. We can. Thank you, Yorit. Yes, great. So this is the main uh, cbi.eu website. And if you then go to live it down to market information, um, yeah, you can find more information about different studies, uh, about different sectors, for example. I go a little bit down, you can see here all the different sectors um, that we're doing research about. Uh, you can do uh, some search items, for example, but also if you want to be uh, more informed about new publications, for example, you can subscribe to our newsletter. Looking at, this is something new. <laughs> Looking at uh, the specific olive oil sector, uh, you click on processed fruits and vegetables and edible nuts because that is the sector that olive oil is in. 
uh, and you go directly to this to this page where you see already more links to other um, to other studies. Um, you can get some tips to find buyers, tips to do a business, to go digital, for example. Um, if you go further down, you can see here olive oil. If you click on it, you see the two studies that we have conducted so far. Uh, the one is focusing on market potential, the other on market entry. And you can see here they're lastly updated on the 3rd of January, uh, but the 2nd of December, uh, the studies that has been presented also today will be uh, updated by then. So the 2nd of uh, December, you can find the new studies. So you can read the studies here. Um, you can easily navigate to the whole course if you don't want to um, go through everything. You just click on the different uh, the contents, the different titles. Um, and if your internet is not the best, they can also download this research and um, save it on your, uh, on your laptop. Any questions are also available. You can uh, ask them here and maybe potential related uh, researchers as well. Um, yeah, so that, that was it for me. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for being here and uh, over to you, Tonia. Thank you so much, Renee. And we have just one more slide to share with our audience. And that is the reminder of the upcoming webinars. I will just leave this information here so that you can see it and the website information is there as well. Closing down this webinar for today, apologies for the delay. We hope that you found it very interesting as we did to hear the presentations from our various experts. So for your information as our public, we are going to share an evaluation form with you. It's going to take just one minute for you to fill it in, even less than a minute. If you think this webinar was fantastic, give us a 10. If you think it was horrible, give us a one. If you think we're somewhere, somewhere in between, give us a number in between. We appreciate your feedback and thank you for taking the time to fill it out. We are, as I said at the beginning, we have recorded this webinar. We're going to be sharing the link with you so that you can view the entire webinar and the presentations that were given. We're also going to share the link to the market studies that Kasha was talking about. However, bear in mind that it's going to take a little while for you, that information to reach you. The market studies are going to, the updated market study is going to be published on December 2nd, if I remember correctly but uh, you will receive an update that it has been published if you uh, have registered on the CBI website and subscribe to the newsletter, we will update you automatically. I believe that is all we have uh, for today. I'd like to thank the team at CBI, thank our experts again, thank the team at CBI behind the screens as well, and thank you, our audience, for being here today, and we look forward to seeing you at another webinar. Have a wonderful day, and goodbye.